Hi class, welcome to chapter nine. We're going to be talking about Mexicans and Central Americans. Latinos are the largest non-European ethnic group in the United States. And according to the seventh edition textbook, they represent 17% of the population. There are 25 Latin American countries. They all have diverse backgrounds as well as origins and some even have different languages. However, Spanish is the official language. French and Portuguese are sometimes spoken as well as traditional native languages. So Mexicans are classified depending on their heritage, and 80% are considered mestizos. These are Mexicans with mixed Spanish and Indian ancestry. They live in what is now considered the American Southwest, um, and they have lived there for hundred of, hundreds of years. So some of our United States are actually formerly Mexican territory. They can be classified into different groups depending on their immigration and birthplace. So Chicanos are Mexicans who are born in the US or who immigrated from Mexico and became US citizens. Braceros are Mexicans who work here legally but remain Mexican citizens. And then unauthorized migrants are kind of what it sounds like. Many came after the war to work on farms and as a great labor source and many decided to remain. Many Mexicans continue to work here legally, and they are the largest group of legal immigrants to the United States. Mexican Americans make up 59% of the Latino community, and this is quite a large percentage of them. Most of them have settled in the West Coast. However, this is changing, and they are you know, moving to places like New Jersey, New York, Georgia, and Florida as well. Many of them live within California, New Mexico, et cetera. This is a picture of concentration of Hispanics in the American Southwest and the dividing line. And you can see that the darkest orange states are populations that have highest percentages of Hispanics. This was as of 2013 um, from the US Census Bureau. And so it's possible that some regions have even higher amounts. The small triangles represent U.S. border patrol sections. So there are actually some in the south as well as in the north from Canada. This represents um, populations of Mexicans and Mexican Americans. The red line is a territory line. And so anything under this red line actually used to belong to Mexico. So like I said before, we are living in um, land and territory that was formerly Mexican territory. It's estimated that there are quite a few illegal Mexicans living in the US. I've seen between eight and nine million, depending on the source. Even though they are the highest population of legal immigrants, there's still a pretty high population of illegal immigrants. Their income is lower on average and they are more likely to live in poverty. Only 60% of adults who are born in Mexico graduate high school, but with regards to immigrants, the majority of them graduate high school, and even many of them go on to college. There are kind of three main socioeconomic statuses, migrant farm work, urban barrios, and a cultured middle class. I would add that there is an upper class both within the United States and with Mexico. Worldview. So many Chicanos and Braceros, as well as unauthorized immigrants, preserve their culture. They continue to speak their native language, whether it's Spanish or something else, eat Mexican foods, listen to Mexican music, um, stick to their religious practices and traditional cooking styles. La Raza is a name given to the people, and it represents a pride for all of the people living in Latin America and from Latin American heritage. The church is very important to them, and primarily they are Roman Catholic or Protestant. They enjoy many feast days, Easter, Christmas, weddings, baptisms, etc. are all celebrated with large feasts. Family is very important, and the well-being of the family comes before the individual. Often, if somebody has immigrated to the United States, but the rest of the family is home in Mexico, that person will be sending money back home and visit as often as possible. 
it is a pretty masculine society, and it was expected that the woman was subservient to the man. However, gender roles are changing slightly. Traditionally, girls were kept at home and boys were sent off to school, but now there is more resemblance of equal opportunity for both. Mexicans' traditions and health beliefs and practices. So they do believe that health is a gift from God and illness is due to outside forces. They believe in prayer and take pilgrimages to appropriate religious sites, such as the Shrine of St. Francis or the Virgin Mary. They'll purchase something called regalos, which I, I didn't put a picture of here, but they're tiny metal pieces that are shaped like an injured part of a body, such as a foot, a heart, or leg. And then these are offered to the church in hopes that that part would help them heal. There is a lot of maternal emphasis as far as healthcare goes, and mothers are generally considered the experts and the healers. They use a lot of home remedies such as tea, Alka-Seltzer, or laxatives. If those aren't working, they'll seek help of the yerbuero, which is a herbalist, or they might go to a botanica, which sells herbal items and therapeutic items. They may seek help of a curandero if the yerbuero and botanica don't work. Uh, a curandero has healing powers and is seen for a broad range of problems such as infertility, business failure, diabetes, and cancer. And a curandero does not charge for services. Again, I, I'm doing my best with translation here, but I apologize if my pronunciation is not perfect. They believe in five main causes of illness, emotion, dislocation of organs, magic, imbalance in hot or cold, and anglo disease. An example of an anglo disease might be pneumonia or appendicitis. They have a concept called susto, and this is a disease or ailment, and it's due to excessive emotion, such as anger, shame, or stress. And it could also be due by seeing be due from seeing a ghost. It can be cured by sugar or sugar water because what doesn't sugar make better? And if it's very serious, the person is very affected, they would need to see a curandero. They do believe in the evil eye, which is referred to as mal de ojo. And the treatment for an evil eye uh, involves sweeping the body with an egg. So holding an egg in one's hand, sweeping it over the body, then breaking an egg into a saucer or a dish and reading the egg to see how to cure the mal de ojo. They believe the evil eye has supernatural origins. It might have flu-like symptoms such as fever and headache, and in extreme circumstances can even cause, cause death. I found this picture, um, and it says, 10 superstitions my Mexican family believes. And I, I'm not trying to be stereotypical or anything like that. This was found on the internet when I was looking up Monde Ojo in Mexico. Um, and I have had previous students come to me and say, oh yeah, my mother talked about that or my grandmother talked about it. So I think some cultures, some families still practice it and others do not. I'm not implying that it's a superstition. This was this person's own opinion of their own family. Impacho is a digestive ailment characterized by nausea, gas, and weakness, and it could be due to eating too many hot or cold foods. They think it's caused by a wad of food adhered to the stomach, and stomach massage as well as herbal teas can help treat it. Traditional foods. To me, traditional foods are delicious foods. They love all sorts of chilies, cocoa, beans, corn, and tomatoes. The Aztecs were very agrarian and they farmed and practiced animal husbandry. They raised dogs, they raised turkeys, they eventually would raise cattle when that came about as well as pork and poultry. Aztec royals ate very well. For example, Montezuma was an Aztec royal and it was said that he would eat up to 30 dishes. They might include roast turkey, quail, duck, fish, crab, lobster, frog, turtle, tomatoes, or chocolate. <clears throat> They did, like I say, raise turkeys and dogs and use them for meat. Corn was a staple grain, and you'll notice this throughout pretty much all the cultures we're talking about today. Some Spanish contributions into Mexican food, cinnamon, garlic, onions, rice, sugarcane, wheat, and hogs. And then the Spanish were the ones to actually introduce the distillation of alcohol. So the primary alcohols produced from distillation were tequila and mezcal. 
staples. So what is the staple bread? The staple bread of Mexico is the tortilla. And traditionally, this is this would be a handmade corn-based tortilla. In the United States, we can see corn or flour-based tortillas, even alternative grains. But a traditional bread would be a corn-based tortilla. Other staples we can think of, uh, maybe beans, maybe rice, depending on the region. I think of tomatoes, sometimes onions, um, fruits are commonly had at a meal, uh, the tortilla in different forms, such as tortilla chips and sometimes different cheeses. One dish meals are very common. A caldo is a soup or a stew. Um, chilaquiles are pictured there and they're a little bit like nachos, but not quite. Often they're baked, so the chips can sometimes get soggy. Um, sometimes they're more crispy, but sometimes they're soggy, and sometimes it could be served for breakfast. But it's tortilla chips with different meats, cheeses, salsas, sometimes even eggs mixed in. Very, very delicious. There's often onions in there, um, and sometimes the tortillas are crushed up. Additional specialties, so grilled or fried meats or slow cooked meats. Um, they use brine for pork rind a lot and they will slow cook meats to soften tougher cuts of meat. They'll use all parts of the animal. Stuffed foods, tamales, quesadillas, tacos, burritos, and flautas. Tamales date back to the Aztec period. I think they're absolutely delicious. The, the dough is traditionally made from masa harina or pozole and it's placed in corn husks or sometimes avocado leaves. And then when we talk about Central America, it's usually placed in banana leaves. Flautas means fruit, uh, flute, not fruit, flute. And it's a variation on the taco. It involves a tortilla that's tightly rolled around a filling and then it's fried. So it might have green sauce or guacamole or meat or cheese filling in here. Often they cook outside, they cook on uh, concrete stoves that have fires burning in them and they'll use large cast iron pots, cast iron skillets, often will prepare large meals at once, especially when they're doing something big like tamales, they'll make them all in one big pot. Vegetables that are popular, so potatoes, green tomatoes, onions and chilies, sugar cane is very important to Mexican culture, desserts are very important, they eat a lot of egg-based desserts, dulce de leche, which is made by boiling down condensed milk until the sugar caramelizes, and dried fruits or nuts, which I have some pictures of. Beverages, aguas naturales, are fresh fruit. It's been blended with water. Sometimes sugar is added. Once in a while, milk is added. It just kind of depends on the person. This is a picture of a, a chili, and you can see that it has red pomegranate seeds, white sour cream, and then some green onion, and that's meant to represent the colors of the Mexican flag. So these are pictures I took of some dried fruits, um, nuts, and then also sugar-coated kind of dates and fruit products in, um, this was in Baja, California. Regional variations. So the plains include the northern and central Mexico, and this is mostly half the nation. They're very arid and dry, and they can include plains, mountains, and valleys. Pine trees grow a lot, and so they enjoy pine nuts. There is some limited variety of food, and so foods try to influence the natural flavors. This was a range where cattle were introduced, and specifically longhorn cattle, and so beef was very common. Piñones are pine nuts. Um, Spanish introductions to this region, I just mentioned cattle. With cattle came dairy products as well as wheat, and so you might find wheat in some of the products. Barbacoa is barbecue, queso fundito is like a fondue-like cheese that's served with chorizo and chips. Chorizo is like a type of sausage. Bonuelos are pictured there. They're fried dough that's then coated with cinnamon and sugar, and of course, tequila. Tropical regions. So tropical areas are generally on the south coast uh, and eastern Mexico, sometimes along the coast. They enjoy seafood, black iguana at times, although it's protected in some places. Cheramoya they enjoy. They enjoy yucca, sapote, which is pictured there, and guanabana. Sapote is a tomato-like fruit. You can see it's green or blackish, and it's supposed to be custard-like and taste kind of like chocolate pudding. I, I have never had one. Uh, guanabana is also called soursop, and it has white pulp and the black seeds, like you can see. Um, it's supposed to be flavored kind of strawberry, coconut, or banana, and then the cherimoya is there. 
Yucatan. The Yucatan is often referred to as the Yucatan Peninsula. Many people know this as the um, Cancun, Playa de Carmen region, which I, I had a chance to visit the Playa de Carmen region just over the Christmas break and enjoy some of these foods. They like to wrap their foods in banana leaves. It's a hotter, kind of more jungly, tropical climate. And so banana trees will grow wild in the Yucatan region. They cook a lot outdoors. They make a lot of black beans. Salbutes or salbutes, I'm not exactly sure how that's pronounced, are pictured here. And they're small corn tortilla tacos that have been made with black beans. And that gives them the coloring that's darker for the tortilla. They use citrus a lot as a seasoning, lemons, limes, oranges, etc. And a lot of seafood is very popular. Um, lobster is very popular. Shrimp are very popular. Southern Mexico. So Southern Mexico is known for their cocoa trees and cocoa literally means uh, bitter. They use it to flavor sweet and savory dishes such as making moles, which are a sauce that's often used on meats. Um, moles might be black, green, or red, or even orange, and they could include the cacao, chili peppers. Pork and goats are popular meats, and they do enjoy something called chapulenes. And I, I, again, sorry with the pronunciation, but this is grasshopper. They're traditionally pan fried with chilies, garlic, salt, and lemon. And I have tried these, and they're not as bad as I thought they were going to be. Um, the texture is something to get used to, but the flavor was pretty good. Traditional Mexican cheeses. So cheeses are commonly added to meals and depending on the region, you might get a softer or fresher cheese versus a firmer type of cheese. The fresh cheeses are unripened and they don't melt, but they do soften when heated and they're often used as garnishes, say on top of some beans or on top of uh, perhaps um, a tortilla, something like that. Soft cheeses are smooth cheeses that do melt when heated and they're used for baked dishes a lot. And then firm cheeses are semi-hard and they're often eaten just as a side or to add some flavorings to dishes. Daily meal patterns. So when families could afford to, they enjoyed eating four to five meals a day. They would have breakfast. Um, breakfast would generally be light, such as a bread, a coffee, or a fruit. They would have desayuno, which usually would occur. Um, you, desayuno was breakfast. Um, almuerzo or comida is lunch. Almuerzo is going to be more like a brunch and it was eaten with tortillas, eggs, meats, and beans as well as coffee. Comida could be lunch or it could be a very late breakfast but it was usually lunch and it would be eaten around two o'clock, one or two o'clock and there's many courses. It might include soup, salads, desserts, meats, um, tortillas, beans, rice, etc. Merienda is a small or light meal and usually served around the evening time. It might include sweet rolls, cake or cookies with coffee. And then cena is dessert. Antiojos are snacks and sometimes they're called little whims and they would have tostadas or street food or fresh fruit is often cut up a lot and served as snacks. Special occasions. So Sunday was important. Weddings were important. Quinceañeras, 15th birthday parties. I used to work um, as a waitress and server, and I did a lot of catering for quinceañeras. Very, very celebrated, fun events. Holidays, of course, I mentioned Christmas and Easter. On the holidays, they would save the food prep that took a long time, so tamales, turkey, and different desserts. They celebrated Three Kings Day, and they would make a raisin studded ring shaped cake, which was called the Rosca de Reyes. And inside the bread, there would be a small plastic figure of Jesus and whoever found it would be obligated to hold a party. Candelaria Day includes a mass and it's followed by games and tamales and sweets. Food and etiquette. So mealtime delineates family roles. Generally, the woman would plan and cook the meals. The food would be prepared by the woman and or servants. If she had servants, she would supervise the servants to cook the food. Sharing is considered very important. It's rude to refuse food, and it's expected that you eat everything on your plate. They may say buen provecho. That would be in El Salvador, which is not Mexico, but more Central America. 
they put their hands on the table when not eating, and they don't leave the table before others are finished. They do believe in hot and cold. They believe that hot represents strength, cold represents weakness. They believe that the imbalance between the two and harmony between the two is very important. With regards to foods, they can classify foods by how close they are to the sun, how they're prepared, or how the food affects the body. And so balancing hot foods with cold foods is very important. A rice with soup and beans would be a really good example of a balanced meal. Sour foods are thought to thin the blood and are avoided for women during their menstrual cycles. And then herbal remedies are practiced a lot. Um, acidic foods can cause menstrual cramps. Herbal remedies generally include teas. They believe peanut broth cures diarrhea. Garlic can help with mouth infections, stomach ache and toothache. Honey helps with colic. Oregano helps with fever. And papaya helps with digestion. And papaya truly does help with digestion because it contains something called papain, which is a natural enzyme that helps break down proteins. Foods of Mexico do influence U.S. cooking, as you may know, living in the U.S. It's currently a $10 billion industry, um, currently as, of, as current as this book goes, which is from data from 2014. I would guess it's even higher now. There are four main regions of Mexican cooking. Texas, Mexican food is modified kind of American dishes, so such as tamale pie, nachos, chili con carne, and they use a lot of jalapenos, ground meat. Combo plate, as pictured here, was a Texas invention and not something that would traditionally be served in Mexico, but something that is more Americanized. New Mexico region uses a special chili that was developed just for them. Um, the chili is in everything from Chile Verde to Chile Colorado. They use a lot of pork instead of beef. Sonora region encompasses the Mexican state of Sonora and then Southern Arizona, and they have milder chilies. They also like carne verde. Beef is their favorite meat, and they often have a dried beef that's called machaca. It's stuffed into different foods, and they like wheat. This may be the home of the chimichanga and the burrito. And then California, where we live, are known for taco shops, Latino grocery stores, burritos, um, food trucks, just kind of Mexican food everywhere. This is a link to a talk by a man who wrote a book called Taco USA. And the book itself is fascinating. This TED Talk is also fascinating. It's, it's not a TED Talk, but this talk is fascinating. Um, and you'll be watching some of this talk. I think I recommended at least 20 minutes of it before answering your discussion board. Um, for your own interest, I recommend listening to it all. I like to listen to these things while I'm driving. So this is a very interesting listen. Changes from generations. So between second and first generations, there were lots of changes. First generation were people born in Mexico. Second generation were people whose parents were born in Mexico, but then they were born in the U.S. The consumption of corn tortillas has declined significantly with each generation, and the consumption of alcohol has increased. Also, the consumption of sweets and carbonated beverages have increased. Some additional food adaptations, wheat tortillas are used a lot more than corn tortillas, bean consumption is down, and actually overall meat consumption is down, and some of the traditional cuts of meats aren't eaten as frequently. Fruits and veggies are still popular. In addition to fruits and veggies that would grow in Mexico, they have added apples and grapes, which are not native to Mexico. I did mention soda already. As far as fats go, they're using more fats from milk and um, cheese during the food prep. <clears throat> Meal cycle. So migrant workers continue to eat traditional foods, things like beans, meats, eggs, tortillas, or things that can be taken to go, such as a burrito or something like that. Chicanos have been adopting more American styles of eating and eating, you know, more Western type foods. They do still snack a lot. Changes in preparation method. I mentioned that traditionally they like to be outdoors to cook. Um, now they're using the stove and the oven more and cooking at home is common. Lactose intolerance is pretty prevalent, even though they do eat both milk and some cheeses. 
meal skipping is sometimes common. Um, bread and breakfast cereals, as well as sandwiches, replace tortillas a lot of the time. Spanish, Hispanics go to restaurants more than any other group in the US. Um, their choice of restaurants, I think this is interesting, but they like in order of popularity, fast food, pizza, Mexican fast food, Chinese, coffee, and full service Mexican. And Latino women state that they like the price, the convenience, and the fact that it's child friendly. And as a mom, I could agree with all of those things. Special occasions. So I mentioned about the holidays that they would save foods that took a lot of time to make um, during these times. So things like tamales or enchiladas, um, turkey potentially at Thanksgiving. This is a picture of enchiladas. These ones look like they're wrapped in banana leaves, which might be um, consumed in the Yucatan parts of Mexico or southern parts of Mexico or as we migrate towards Central America. Mexican Independence Day, they eat foods that are the color of the flag, which is red, white, and green. Cinco de Mayo celebrates a victory over France, and it's celebrated all over Mexico as well as the U.S., I think sometimes even more here. We celebrate with foods, feasting, dancing, mariachis, margaritas. And then the Aztec New Year's Day welcomes the beginning of the Aztec solar calendar, um, which is different than the traditional calendar. Nutritional status. So I, I want to do kind of like a disclaimer on this. Um, this is according to our text. It says life expectancy is similar to other Americans. This is true once a Mexican American has been living in the US for a very long time their life expectancy will be the same as other Americans. However, new immigrants or first and second generation immigrants often have longer life expectancies and people who live in Mexico themselves often have longer life expectancy. So it kind of depends on the generation. Tooth decay is really common because it's not uncommon for women to give their babies bottles that might contain sugar sweetened beverages, uh, honeys or different teas with sugar in them. They do do well with the healthy food index, um, but unfortunately, like I said, as they acculturate, this reduces. There is a pretty big problem with obesity. Oh, I see I have two of the same pictures here, but that's okay. Many children are overweight. Um, I've seen this myself. Parents often don't realize it and or don't know what to do with it. Traditionally, overweight meant health, well-being, also that you were potentially of higher income, so there's a lot of kind of societal expectations and stereotypes that maybe need to be readdressed. They have very high prevalence of diabetes. They have high prevalence of metabolic syndrome, which could include heart disease, insulin resistance, or high blood pressure. Um, but their overall incidence of cardiac disease is lower. So I, I like these charts. These compare U.S. born Hispanics versus foreign born Hispanics. So people who were second or later generation versus first generation. And you can see that in first generation, which is in orange, there is lower rates of cancer, heart disease, obesity, and cigarette smoking. Once people are born in the US or people who are born and raised here, they have higher rates of all of these diseases. So I'm sorry, our US is doing horrible things to people who immigrate or adopt our food habits and lifestyles. All right, Central America. So I think Central America, as well as Mexico and South America, are beautiful places to visit. Um, I've had the opportunity to visit Mexico many, many times. I have visited Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Guatemala, and then most recently I went to Panama last year. And so I've just really enjoyed all of these countries and would like to continue to be able to visit them. Traditionally, men were the immigrants from these countries because they came for work. However, now more and more, it's actually becoming easier for women to find work who immigrate. This is a map of Central America. Yeah, I have not been to Belize. I have stepped across El Salvador when driving, but not spent much time in it. Same with Honduras. Um, I've been to Guatemala, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. But even within these countries that I've visited, I've only seen such a small region that I would really love to go back. 8% of Americans are from Central America, so a lot less than from Mexico. They do settle in similar places, though, to Mexicans, so Texas, Florida, and California. Many are Roman Catholic, just like Mexicans, and family is highly valued. 
often in the US, women actually find jobs easier than men. And so these are pictures of all employed women from Central America. And this has created some rifts with domestic roles at the homes between men and women. They do believe good health and fresh air is important to maintain health. Um, they do a lot of walking, they do a lot of going to things like farmer's markets, um, and they think that thinness is associated with sickness. They think many Americans are too thin, and this indicates sickness. They believe in witchcraft, healers, and naturalists, hot and cold, and over-the-counter remedies are common. Many things can be bought locally without a prescription, things like cough suppressants. Um, they may use herbs, chamomile, different teas, etc. Early Mayan diet was corn and beans. These are considered staples. A dish that they make is actually pictured there, and that's yours truly. Um, this is me in Nicaragua eating a typical um, breakfast or breakfast typico, what they call it, or desayuno typico, um, comida típica. And this has gallo pinto. Gallo pinto is beans and rice with onions, and it translates to painted rooster. And so I would have this every single morning for breakfast. Um, when I did, I, I went to Costa Rica. When I was there, I was doing a Spanish school, and I stayed with a family. And every meal, we had gallo pinto, every single meal, gallo pinto. And my mother would say to me, ¿Quieres gallo pinto? ¿Quieres gallo pinto? And I loved it. It was really delicious. Um, but I think at the end of the two weeks, I, I actually didn't want any more of it. But it's very, very delicious. Papusas are something common in El Salvador. These are handmade corn tortillas. They're filled with cheese, pork, or beans, and then they're fried. And corn tortillas and open-faced enchiladas are common. These are additional pictures, close-ups of the food. Again, this is in Nicaragua, so depending on which uh, area of Central America you're in, you're gonna get different food. But here's the gallo pinto, very good. And these are plantain chips. Um, they are not commonly locally eaten with ketchup. That was my own bad decision, but these are made from plantains. And then right here is some fried cheese, which was very common to have for breakfast there. French bread is common in Honduras and Guatemala and was actually introduced to them by Mexicans. Soups and stews are common, coffee, hot chocolate, and something called refrescas. This is generally tropical fruit flavors that are mixed with water and ice and sometimes milk. These are pictures I took quite a while ago in Guatemala. This was over 10 years ago, um, but of different stores I went into selling different prepared foods as well as dried foods. And I, I love all these pictures, but I love this one on the bottom left because you've got all these fresh spices and, you know, um, oops, beans and legumes. And then right here, you've got this cornflakes and you can see in the back, there's some processed foods as well. Coconut is very common in Belize and Honduras. Again, those are countries I haven't visited, so I, I haven't been able to experience that. El Salvador is known for fried foods. Nicaragua, they use a lot of sweet juices, and I would agree with that. Costa Rica, herb, cilantro, thyme, and oregano. Um, this picture on the far right is a picture that I actually took. And this was the kitchen outside of my house in Costa Rica where I stayed with my family. And so you can see the gas. This is like an empty gas back here. Um, there's a grill. Let me get the pen out. There's a grill right here. Um, this is the empty gas, and this was the stove. This is a cast iron skillet. My Costa Rica mom, she didn't have any sort of grips to hold this skillet, so she would stick a piece of wood in there and then use a very large kind of oven mitt to get these out. But this, she made these very thick homemade um, corn tortillas that were quite delicious, and she'd make them over the open fire. So every morning, this was my view of fresh breakfast being cooked. This picture is from Panama, and it's unfortunately not a picture that I ate, uh, not a picture that I took of a food that I ate, because I didn't get to try this, although I saw it on the menu a lot. Um, Sanchocho is a specialty of Panama, and it's a stew. It's pork, beef, ham, sausage, tomato, potato, squash, and plantains. This is uh, Panama last December, so about 
over a year ago, um, myself and my mother uh, by the Panama Canal. Um, we actually, some of these are food related, some tourist related. So these were Panama Canal. Uh, this is me and my son. We went to one of the islands where Survivor was filled, so that film, so that was pretty cool for me. This was in a, a town called um, Valle de Anton. It had a lot of beautiful views and vistas and hiking. This was a street vendor making a shaved ice and he had this gigantic cube of ice and um, he had a hand carving machine that he would attach to these styrofoam cups. He would flip the cup upside down with this carving machine attached to it and he would carve into the cup as much ice as would fit and then put some syrups on top. This is my son and different pictures of things that we ate. Um, Panama is surrounded by water on two sides, obviously, since it's the canal. And so ceviches were very common. Ceviches are raw fish that's been cured in typically lime juice. It could also be raw seafood such as octopus or shrimp. Um, so ceviche and plantains were very common. Plantains are like bananas, but more starchy, less sweet, and they could be not typically eaten raw, usually cooked. So um, this dish was ceviche served inside a coconut with some plantain chips. And then these were tiny little cups that had been made out of plantains and inside was some ceviche. This is a menu from one of the restaurants that was considered a, a typical restaurant in Panama. This is me looking a little bit rough after um, <laughs> waking up in the morning. Uh, I think this was the day after we arrived. But anyways, this was me at our hotel eating a breakfast buffet, which I absolutely loved because they had everything on this breakfast buffet. And if I could eat this breakfast every day of my life, um, I would, maybe minus the chicken I don't need every day. But I loved that they served vegetables and fresh fruits at the breakfast. Um, this was uh, chicken, I forgot what this is called, but I'm going to say it really quickly. Um, this was a typical dish called, uh, oh, pollo guisado, sorry. And then this is a zoomed in picture of my breakfast. It had this broccoli that had this slightly creamy sauce on it, potato wedges. This was fresh carrots, peppers, onions that were just grilled, um, papaya, watermelon, gallo pinto. And then this was some of that chicken. I just had to try it because I had read about it in our book and it was all very delicious. I could have eaten breakfast there all day. These were also very delicious. Um, well, not all of this, but these tamales here. So in Panama, we stayed at our house, uh, a little house in Airbnb, and the caretaker there provided dinner for us for a small charge, and she would provide these Panamanian tamales, which were absolutely delicious. They were in um, banana leaves, and the Corn masa was very, very thin, as well as seasoned, just very savory. So these were delicious. These are some plantain chips pictured up top. Um, pretty simple and flavorless, really, unless you add salt or something to them, but a very good staple of the diet. And then this was probably one of the most disgusting breakfasts I've had, um, not only in my life, but especially in Panama. But this was at one of the hotels. So some hotels did a very traditional breakfast to Panamanian culture. Other hotels did a very like American type of breakfast minus this hot dog. So this was like hot dog, some odd like lunch meat and lunch cheese combo, a little bit of jam and some bread um, and yuck, but good to see the variation. <clears throat> okay. So <laughs> Moving on, um, beans and corn, very much a staple. They do celebrate Catholic holidays, so Christmas, Easter, and they celebrate something called All Saints Day. They celebrate it with a salad called Piambre, and it is pictured here. And as you can see, this salad has absolutely everything in it. It has green beans, peas, carrots, cauliflower, beets, radishes, cabbage, beef, pork, etc., salami, cheese, eggs. Um, and it is a very hearty salad that's used on this All Saints Day. Etiquette, they generally say buen provecho and hands should be above the table with elbows at the edges, but not on. 
similar etiquette to Mexico. Bread and tortillas on the side of the plate, they do eat more breads than strictly tortillas, but you can use them to scoop up the food. You are expected to clear the plate just like in Mexico, and ask, asking for seconds would be a compliment. So very similar to Mexico. Asking for seconds indicates that the food was delicious and you would like to enjoy more. Therapeutic uses of foods, they do believe in some hot and cold balance. Sometimes they avoid ice cubes in hot weather. I'm not sure because you would think that that would help with balance, um, but that's something I need to understand more. Herbal teas are very popular. They uh, will have manzanilla tea for menstrual cramps, cold or the flu, banana leaf tea for digestion, hibiscus tea for respiratory illness, and urinary tract infections. And Guatemalans believe that diarrhea is caused by hot weather and can be cured by eating cold drinks. And Panamanians avoid cold foods when sick. So there's a lot of variation in the hot and cold. Dietary adaptations. Milk is typically disliked in Guatemala, but liked in San Salvador. Meats and fish, bean dishes are very popular. Cereals, tortillas have been replaced mostly by breads, but are still used in some places. Fruits and veggies, beverages, you can guess, sugar-sweetened beverages, more candies, cookies, and cakes. Health, infant mortality rates are below the average, so that is good, that would be a good thing. Breastfeeding is considered healthy but impractical. Often mothers are needing to work around the house, in the yard, or actually at a physical job. And so sometimes siblings are taking care of children. Overweight is still a problem and happening very frequently due to importation of processed foods as well as immigration and cons consuming American type diets. And I'd like to end with this picture. This is a picture that I took in Guatemala, again, about 10 years ago. And I saw this little girl here. She was outside of one of the Mayan temple ruins. And I don't know how old she is, maybe five, maybe younger. Um, and she's eating this cup of noodles and a Fanta. And this was, was I even studying nutrition then? This was when I had first st started studying nutrition. Um, and this picture broke my heart. This little girl broke my heart because she's so sweet and so innocent. And I, I know that this is probably not her daily diet, but so bad. So anyways, American foods are moving around the world and it's not necessarily a good thing. All right. I hope you learned something, maybe enjoyed some pictures. Hope you're inspired to travel. I love traveling to these areas. Um, I still think it can be pretty safe and I'll talk to you soon.